Hey, welcome to the Game Dungeon. Today we're looking at Contraption Zack. This is a third person puzzle game. Okay, now wait for it. Ah! I completely approve of having to throw some giant switch in order to start your game. Now this game has a pretty good intro, so let's check it out. We open with Zack outside Gadget Co. in a car like I used to have. And I didn't notice this the first time, but I think we're also witnessing either a plane or space shuttle going down in flames. Zack's first day on the job. Maybe a meteor. All right, on the job training. We're off to a riveting start here. Whoa. Well, Zack is excited. Yep. This is serious. Can you handle the power bestowed upon you, Zack? Gadgetco is where heroes are forged. Later that morning. Or technically 31 hours and 45 minutes later if we're to trust the clocks. Did you see the new guy? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> he don't look too bright if you ask me. What's a rib? You know what that means? Yeah! <laughs> Huh, he'll never make it. <laughs> You're about to become popular, Zack. Hey guys, how's it going? My name's Zack. Hi, Jack. Hey, Zack, can I borrow your hammer? Sure. Hey, kid, I need your tape. Uh, okay. Whoa, whoa, why didn't you ranch? Well, uh, okay. Just be sure to bring everything back. Zack! Uh oh. Zack! Plant number four is experiencing major system malfunctions and the suits are on their way! You gotta get in there and fix it before they get here! Yes, sir, Mr. Flanagan. Right away, sir. This seems like a lot of responsibility being dumped on Zack for his first day. Hey guys, I need my tools back. You hurt your back? Sorry, Zack! I lost your hammer! Sorry, kid. I have racquetball. Oh yeah! Michael has it! Welcome to Gadget Co., Zack. Oh, I get it. I'm the new guy. We'll just see who comes out on top. And with that, we begin. We start off and there's a jukebox blasting in the lobby because I guess that's a normal thing at an industrial manufacturing company. Actually, I'm not sure what this company does. More on that later. Now, if you watch the Net 3 episode, you'll remember how I said that game lulls you in with easy challenges and a happy atmosphere before moving in for the kill. Well, not Contraption Zack. This game is far more honest with you about what it is. Right away, the first lesson you learn is that you can screw yourself. Look, I hit the wrong button, now I'm trapped by spikes. What am I supposed to do now? Nothing. I'm trapped in this grid for the rest of my life. Welcome to 90s gaming. But the game is not completely without mercy. One of your main options is to restart. Hey, look, it's that jukebox again. Well, if you progress past the second screen, then you get one of the more annoying puzzles in the game. There's not much to this puzzle. You press the button, and that lowers the spike wall. Except, wait a minute, these buttons are on a timer until they reset. Now's a great time to mention that the controls to this game are sluggish and not very responsive. But this is a puzzle game, not an action platformer. So quick and fluid controls are not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. Or rather, they wouldn't be if I didn't have to pull off these split-second maneuvers before getting shut off by spikes. And hey, if I screw up here? Yep, that's right. Back to the jukebox. I've mentioned this before, but I'm kind of binary when it comes to puzzles. Either give me a puzzle and let me take my time to figure it out, or give me something fast-paced where I need to be responsive. Don't give me both at the same time. Combining split-second timing with puzzles you need to think through, for me, is like having a timed quiz where the teacher rips the paper out of your hand while you're trying to finish. Can't say I'm a fan. Not that there's much to figure out on this one. 
It's mostly just throwing myself at the buttons until the gates stay open long enough for me to pull it off. In fact, the most effective way is to slip out of the gate just in time before it closes on you again. However, the timing on this is so, so borderline that I honestly can't tell if this is how I'm actually supposed to solve this or if this is just an exploit. I can't pull this trick off reliably, even when I'm pressing the keys as fast as I can down to the millisecond. This is why I say this game doesn't hide its intentions. It's not your friend. It's here to trap you. But I eventually make it, due to dumb luck more than anything else. Let's move on to the next area. Ah! 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 Okay, so that was an interesting music choice for the beginning. I guess the game wants me to talk about the music next. A few tracks are annoying. But most are pretty great and have exactly the sort of vibe I would want for this sort of game. Kind of SimCity-ish. My only complaint is this old school ad-lib music, which I was never a huge fan of. Some of these tracks would absolutely benefit from a modern rendition. But back to the game, it has more lessons to teach us. The next one we learn here is everything you need to do, you do it in the longest way possible. If you think you see a shortcut, it's a trap. This becomes really apparent solving one of the first puzzles, where I have to loop all the way around repeatedly. And it's not just this puzzle, it's most of the game. Look at this sequence here. I need to follow a path in order to press a switch. There's no puzzle here. This isn't the exit to the level and they're building things up. I just need to press a switch. There's only one way to walk there, and then I have to walk all the way back. This takes two and a half minutes. Now that sounds tolerable, but remember, if you make a mistake afterwards, you get to do it all over again. And again. Despite his boss freaking out earlier, Zack is not in a hurry. Oh no. Whatever Zack's job description is, he is paid by the hour. There's no going home early because you got all your work done at this company. Zack never runs or even walks at a fast pace, ever. Anyway, this level isn't too hard, and I eventually start this conveyor belt and get to proceed to the next area. And even though I found some of my tools in the last level, they're gone by the next. I guess my coworkers hit me in the back of the head with a monkey wrench so they could re-steal them from me because they're positively ecstatic <laughs> about hiding them all over again. I almost feel bad taking them back, they're enjoying this so much. Level 2 is much better. If you're observant and keep track of what you're doing, all the puzzles here make sense and don't require too much in the way of trying to outrun timers. It's still easy to screw yourself, but it's more your own fault this time. Although I'm impressed by this part. If you don't run towards the end there, that elevator goes down, then that's it. It's gone. It's almost kind of amazing for me to see this, because just about every other game on the planet has a way for a lift to come to you. Either automatically, on a timer, or pressing a button. Not this game. Level 3 is more of your basic antagonism by looping you around in the longest way possible again. Also, towards the end, they introduced these gates that at first I thought were random. In the time span of three minutes, they never opened and shut in exactly the same sequence. Looking back at the video, however, I can see that one of the gates opens roughly every 8 seconds, and the other one opens roughly every 14 seconds. Sometimes it's a little shorter, sometimes a little longer. I didn't know that. So I just kept trying to run through here like a maniac until I finally got it through raw persistence. Although even if I had known this, I'm not sure how much it would have helped. If you're someone who can count two separate timers simultaneously in your head, then you're a greater player than I am. Level 4 is where the game really comes to fruition. I must have tried this level at least 10 times. Normally, I like to think there's no logic puzzle I can't solve given enough time, but this one is such a bastard. 
To begin with, the first five minutes of this level is more of that back looping crap where every single switch activates some other switch in another room. So you have to wander around each room until you figure out which one you trigger. Here's a spoiler of the bare minimum of what you need to do just to start off. And this is if you know exactly what to do. In practice, it's going to take someone a lot more steps than this because you're not going to have every switch memorized. I don't even consider this part of a puzzle because it's just wandering around hitting switches. Have you ever had to fix an electrical socket and you need to figure out which circuit breaker to turn off so you don't die? This is like that, except slower. But this isn't the real problem. Here is where we learn the final lesson to Contraption Zack. And that's there is no consistency to anything. There was a taste of this in level 3, but here's where they really drive it home. See, up until now, square buttons change other devices permanently. Circular buttons have been on a timer. Also, colored buttons and switches only correspond to spikes or gates of the same color. Not anymore. Look at this. I flip a yellow switch. Gray spikes go up also. Oops. I mean, the gray button makes the yellow spikes go up. Wait, what? That purple switch controls purple spikes. The green switch controls a spring platform. There are no green spikes. And of course, this orange switch also triggers gray spikes, which trap me in here. How could I have possibly known that? What's the point of having color coding to your puzzles if you're just gonna break the rules as you go? Now rectangular buttons have timers, circular buttons are permanent, colors can mean something else. Sometimes. Always sometimes. The logic is broken now. You never truly know what you're doing anymore. The game starts descending into chaos from here. See, a good puzzle game would have this overly complex layout of pipes that you could trace along and the pressure layout would make some sense if you really looked at it and figured it out. Not here. Just keep swapping pipes until something does something you want it to. Or here, look at this. I hit a switch and oh, that only activates one set of spikes. I guess I have to go back around the long way, but wait, I can't go back. Did I just screw myself again? No, it turns out I didn't have to hit the switch once. I had to hit it seven times. Why? Then there's this area. I don't want to talk about this one too much. A lot of bad memories. All I'll say is there are multiple layers of how you can screw yourself on this one. Not just the obvious ways. If you're looking at this and think you have it figured out, you don't. But back to this level. I couldn't figure it out. I got to the point where I needed to fix this wire. Although even then, I didn't actually know that. I just deduced it because there was literally nothing else for me to fiddle with. Except for one other button, but we're coming to that. But lo and behold, if I fix this wire, then the lift drops down into the lava here and I'm screwed. So I came to one of two conclusions. One, maybe this switch in the next room does something because there are wires leading from it to the lift. All it did earlier was control spikes in yet another room, but maybe I need it here. Nope, still screwed. Can't be it. So my other theory was, hey, there are orange spikes blocking me here. And there's only one orange button in this level. That bear trap of a button from earlier ready to box me in. So I know that button screws me. But hey, maybe because these spikes are up, it's just inversing them, not necessarily raising them. Well, that's a nice theory, but it doesn't matter because I can't even walk over there without lowering them. And don't forget, for every theory like this, I have to go through that slow walk gauntlet of hitting half a dozen switches across four rooms every time before I can test anything. That's it. I'm stuck. There's nothing more I can do here. I'm obviously not getting something. What is it? Well, I looked up a walkthrough, otherwise the episode would have ended right here. And guess what? I did have to hit that switch, but then I had to run across the lift with split second timing before it dropped into the lava. Now before you say I should have thought of that, I want to emphasize this game loves to slam doors in your face. Aw, oh, didn't make it. Too slow, sucker. The game revels in letting you know you did something the wrong way. I assume this lift was more of the same. But I admit, I didn't notice the difference between a fast death and a faster death. 
That was my mistake. So I had the right solution all along, but the game is so antagonistic, it convinced me I was doing it wrong. That's something a super villain would do. Looking at it now, I can see the puzzles seem to follow a similar pattern. First, you see switches and buttons where you can frequently figure out what they do. Then you try to deduce what switches and buttons you need to hit in order to achieve your goal. The rest is madness. No consistency, no patterns, just stumbling around in the dark, like the game forgot it was supposed to be a puzzle and not a pit trap. It's usually in this order, too. The insanity tends to come towards the end. The things I have to do to solve some of the puzzles astound me. Like, this is obviously a grid-based, isometric game. But on multiple occasions, I've had to walk in between the grid in order to solve the puzzle. That's like leaving your piece on the line in chess. I was already accepting that I can straight up climb a flat wall, but can't vault a pipe or cross a simple rope. But this is something else. It's not just the puzzles either. There's madness bleeding over into the rest of the game. I mean, what, do we really think Zack's co-workers haven't killed anyone before? What, you thought I wasn't going to talk about the blood leaking out of the locker here? Oh no, I saw it. The best case scenario is that one of the workers decided to go rabbit or turkey hunting before work, and instead of leaving it in his car, stuffed it in his locker and the blood leaked out. I can't come up with a more benign explanation. I mean, I'm not even going to get into the multiple stain patterns over here that suggest different causes, or this numbering system in general. Oh yeah, racquetball. He's got a machete inside that bag. He's going to go hack up some drifter. But this game mostly sidesteps everything with this bright and happy presentation, Zack's chipper attitude, and upbeat music. This game is not nearly as dark as it could be. It keeps the horror beneath the surface. Look at that, if you're standing in front of the spikes, they stop. A darker game wouldn't hesitate to impale Zack like a pincushion. So there's still that sense of mercy buried in here. This game isn't yet three, it's just a really friendly and approachable madness. And Zack's a part of this too. Look at those glazed eyes. No one sane works at this company, and it shows. I've beaten this game and I still don't know what's manufactured here or what this company's business model is. It's just there and by God is it busy doing something. It doesn't matter. There's a lot going on is the important part. I think this game hits on a larger theme. It's a combination of cheery presentation, overcomplicated industry, and a touch of madness. I've seen this elsewhere. On this show, Construction Bob works at another manufacturing company where we're not sure what they're doing, but their business model involves bouncing workers on trampolines in a really dangerous way and grabbing parts to put them together. If you're a Mystery Science Theater 3000 fan, what does Gizmonic Institute actually do? Sending the janitor into space so we could watch bad movies was the side project of one division at the company. While it lacks the industrial element, I almost see this game taking place in the same universe as Toe Jam and Earl. In that game, two aliens crash land on Earth and find parts to put their ship back together. Never mind that Earth is apparently suspended islands floating in space. Who cares? People still need to mow their lawns. I really like this atmosphere of endless puzzles to perform basic tasks mixed with an upbeat atmosphere and insanity lurking in the shadows. I'd love to see something like this on the scale of an MMO, where you activate the belt machine to get your mail, fire up the industrial generator so you can heat up your coffee, get the cutting machine running so you can clip your toenails, and that would all be before you even leave your house to go somewhere. The entire world could be this condensed mechanical jungle of endless puzzles. Because that's really not what Contraption Zack is. For all its complications, this game only has six levels. And when you consider how much they padded out those, this is short. If all the puzzles had some logic behind them, I could have maybe finished this game in a little over an hour. They don't though, so it takes a lot longer in a bad way. Even though I'll cover a lot of old games here, I don't give points for nostalgia. You do have to be able to look past graphics fidelity, but if a game was good in the past, it should still be good now. Well, by that standard, I like everything about Contraption Zack, and I think it holds up great, except the gameplay. 
if they could divorce the madness from the puzzle solving itself and keep it to the rest of the game, this would be a winning formula and very addictive. Contraption Zack is a good universe and this or something like it can make a comeback. I mean, look at his hair. That's a cosplay challenge right there. Okay, I promised a good ending last episode, so let's see it. We activate the last piece of machinery, some water bailing pump thing, and hey, here's the backdoor entrance to the factory or something. Hi, Zach. Okay, now watch the background. Boom, power call. All right, time to get this party started. Hit it, Zach. Yeah, now we're cooking. Skydiver! Okay, looks like we've passed the exosphere. Hey, maybe this is how all those floating islands ended up in space in Toe Jam and Earl. And now we're cutting colored paper and processing it. Although we of course have no way of knowing if that's all this machine does. Oh hey, did you see that? Gadgetco is doing contracting work for Target. That's their logo. Oh, okay, so we're printing spam mail. Shop at Target. Woohoo! Congratulations! You have successfully repaired plant number four. I like the enthusiasm being portrayed here. And we get the same sequence again, but this time we get to see letters printed along with portraits of all the staff while Maple Leaf Rag plays. I'm going to abridge this because hey, the ending isn't quite done yet. All right, you knuckleheads, plan number five is malfunctioning again. But we fixed that last week. Well, it's broken again. Get to work. You're all going to be replaced by robots in 20 years. Meanwhile. Well, you did a good job for your first day, Zach. Hmm, look who left their tools. Uh-oh. It's like that quote from Batman. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. The end. I've always thought that's just something villains say to try to justify themselves, but I guess in this case it's true. You're one of them now, Zack. And that's the game! It kicks you out to DOS afterwards. Get out of here. Okay, that wraps it up. Stay tuned for the next episode for something spooky for Halloween. I'm gonna have a game I've never played before, so even I don't know what I'm in store for. It's gonna get interesting. Okay, ready? Save. Save. I'm hitting every key. You're gonna make me redo this whole level? Save. Ah!